From Lake Tombs, near the eastern seaboard of Tasmania, island state of Australia, their snakes by mountains and through ravines to the grasslands of the Midlands, the life-giving Macquarie River. Normally it is a placid stream, the home of waterfowl, platypuses, eels and ubiquitous trout, one that would have delighted the heart of Isaac Walton. But when winter comes, beware. It skirts the eastern banks of the historic town of Ross, which in its heyday was a centre of rural commerce, garrisoned by redcoats who controlled the convicts and hunted the lawless. Governor Lachlan Macquarie was not one for Sassanac names. In his diary he wrote, Saturday the 2nd of June, 1821. I name last night's station Ross, in honour of H.M. Buchanan Esquire, that being the name of his seat on Loch Lomond in Scotland. What the canny Scots saw was little more than a government reserve, remote, wild, lonely, dangerous tenanted with scrawny cattle, scruffier dogs, mud huts and unkempt humans. But he was a kind man who passed on with an unshakable faith in providence and the future. Ross grew and prospered. It breathes wealthy solidity, along with an almost complete lack of decay of its Georgian personality. Indeed, one cannot go far in this venerable village or its surrounds without surprise at its colonial buildings and a wealth of objects made from its famous freestone. the least of which is Australia's third oldest bridge. The grey, clanking columns of anonymous men who toiled at this peaceful site had one thing in common with the slaves of antiquity. They produced a symbol of intensely hard and effective activity, beside which the fetish of age is largely insignificant. The bridge was designed by John Lee Archer, whose contributions to Tasmania's colonial architecture are renowned for simplicity, good proportions and stability. Australia's awakened conscience of its historic environments has led to intensive action. Tasmania, the state least affected by overpopulation or by overindustrialization, has made an enormous effort to save its heritage from oblivion, for the very good reason that it has the best and the most. Public interest in Ross Bridge was given impetus by archaeologist Leslie Greener, who wrote the first history of it in 1956. 
This was followed by his and Norman Laird's joint work of the same subject in 1971. In recent time, the Tasmanian Department of Public Works set about the mammoth task of restoring the bridge from the ravages of its long life. Engineers inspected it with meticulous care. Divers probed its underwater foundations. Restoration experts from far afield were consulted. Photographs were taken, plans drawn, estimates were prepared and money was supplied. Men and machinery came to Ross. The bridge decking was stripped to the arches and the wet muck of nearly a century and a half of old and imperfect ceiling went out. An archaeologist, Maureen Byrne, followed men and scoops as a seagull follows the plough looking for artefacts of the past. The whole of the bridge was cleaned of fungal growths and grime. The precious sculptures were moulded for posterity. Today, Ross Bridge does not stand exactly anew, but it does possess greater strength and a decking and drainage system as efficient as modern engineering science can provide. Fretted stonework is being replaced, and all bids well for the endurance of the bridge for many years to come. The virtue of all this labour and expense was the preservation of the works of Daniel Herbert, the greatest and the most silent of the nation's earliest sculptors who was born at Taunton Dean, Somerset, England, in 1797. To understand Herbert better, he must be placed against the background of his time. Briefly, war, revolution and romanticism were the salient features of his age. 20,000 people lived in cellars in Manchester, with pigs as their companions. William Cobbett, the prickliest of political journalists, spoke bitterly of dissolute brutes who caused children to become decrepit and deformed and of thousands upon thousands of them slaughtered by consumptions before the age of 16. Daniel came to Tasmania as a convicted highwayman and literally carved his way to freedom. As Leslie Greener said, the bridge is his real memorial a sentiment long current in the oral tradition of the district where he worked and died. Herbert had a profound animus against the establishment of his day. He lost no time in sending it up in a number of guises of imperial power. Each of the massive keystones is a dreadful expression of most compelling oppression, a total embodiment of a long-lived and sardonic anger. Here, that power is given the image of a rat, a symbol of infirmity and death. And here, long before surrealism was born, a nightmare fantasy of lovers in hell, latent with indescribable anguish. There seems to have been no limit to his resourcefulness, no end to his invention of unusual and dynamic forms, many of them as forbidding as they are interesting or beautiful such as this monster in the form of a flower. It is thought that Herbert deliberately set a giant puzzle for the generations of people who have tramped the bridge on their visits to Old Ross. His astute use of symbols from the corridors of prehistory baffled the colonial administration. And certainly his concealed ridiculing of their insolent and lordly disdain passed over them like a black raven at night. Was Herbert a prankster, reveling in a long-sought chance to even the score with his oft-time sanctimonious and brutal captors? Perhaps not. Even so, he was successful, for they are forgotten and he lives on. It seems that it was not by chance that he carved heads at regular intervals on both sides of the bridge. It may be asked if some of these are not, in fact, his macabre trophies, as in the true manner of his warrior ancestors. Let us turn back the clock. Posidonius tells a well-verified tale. Speaking of the Celts with no lack of civilized feeling, he declared, 
There is also that custom of the northern tribes, barbarous and exotic. When they depart from battle, they hang the heads of their enemies from the necks of their horses. And when they have brought them home, they nail them to the entrances of their houses. Did Herbert chisel some of his special hates on the face of Ross? It looks very much like it. Humorless John Calvin, religious fanatic, iconoclast, to whom art was noxious, party to murder. Jorgen Jorgensen, naval officer, author, gambler, convict, policeman, pompous clown. George Arthur, troubleshooter, signatory of death warrants, opportunist, and arrogance personified. Hated by the free and the chained alike. There is little doubt that Herbert's withering contempt for a society largely indifferent to the human condition was spelled out with much the same feeling that the Flemish painter Bosch painted the sadistic tormentors of Christ. However, it should not be thought that he always saw the worst in human nature, though admittedly he had good reason to. His vast gallery shows real compassion for the light and the living. There is his obvious delight with persons who more than likely befriended him. Major William Turner gave him a timepiece and drawing instruments. Schoolmaster and humanist John Headlam was given protective symbols beneath his all-important head. Fiery Maxman William Kermode was accommodated with the correct amount of pride in his head that he himself probably considered fitting as Lord of the Pastures. Herbert's penchant for seeds and plants, for water and faraway stars is hardly novel in an artist, but his predilection for elevating his beasts to the status of Celtic glory is a consistent feature of Gaelic art. This horned canine gazes with enrapt attention at fish below. Or is it a goddess of the waters to which mortals are blind? Old Faithful, with his orbital symbol of the Pathfinder, looks towards the southern lights, the same as his master. But there was a darker side to his arcane nature that appears to have haunted him from his youth to the grave. The melancholia of the poet, a lasting horror of human cruelty that he shared with later artists such as Goya and Rual. Have it as you may, but it was there. Death was often in his thoughts and dreams. So much so that he carved his own portrait and accompanied it with the symbols of the cut bough and fallen leaves. It was not by chance that he placed his likeness exactly opposite to that of his beloved wife in the north light of the sun and himself in the south light in shade and shadow. The prehistoric Celtic influence in his work was apparently his abiding leitmotif. How, where and when he obtained his scholarly knowledge of this culture and its antique mysteries is the most elusive mystery of all. Forms in threes, such as the shamrock and triple Janus heads, were favourites with the Celts. A classic example of Herbert's use of triadic form are these sculptures forming one visual synthesis of a leaf man and bizarre dismembered dancing figures. They possibly represent supernatures of the underworld, as does this stag god, which to the Celts was a conduit of divine power and the supreme being of their pantheon. As a symbol of fertility, it goes back 30,000 years to the cavemen of Lascaux and Altimira. Of the enigmas in Herbert's sculpture, none is more puzzling than this corroded work. A crane, sacred to the Celts, supports a child on its back, and below it are two husks of female heads, much battered by floodwaters. For the Celts, the crane was nearly always associated with transformed women. There is just the possibility that these women were once guests of Ross's happily vanished female factory. 
It was, of course, unthinkable that all his work of 58 weeks and his recondite knowledge should be forgotten, though it might not ever be understood. What better than to carve a guardian for the bridge? This he did, a ferocious horned deity, master of the deluge, tamer of floods and storms, to gaze over the pastoral beauty of Ross, it is hoped forever.